My goodness, this guy is everywhere. People hate seeing themselves as influence. So how would you know if a place would be any good? And relying on our friends and peers helps us make better decisions, not just what the company wants us to think. It's just blowing my mind, to be honest with you. Rather than stepping on the gas so much, we need to figure out what those barriers or obstacles are in, in the way of change and read it like it's an outsider perspective and give that great outsider advice. AI is gonna destroy us all anyway. Like Whether I like this person or not, what are they doing that's working? I wanted to have you on the podcast so bad because I've secretly been stalking you for like a decade now. You may not remember, but I think back in like 2013 or 14 or maybe 15, you spoke at a conference called The Art of Marketing. Yes. That, that came into my hometown of Toronto. And you were speaking on this book, which was your first book, Contagious, which I immediately picked up and I went through and I was like, wow, I love that book. And I started buying it for people and giving it to them. But then because in my agency world, I was working in so many corporate offices and with corporate clients, I would go in and I would notice on everyone's bookshelf, this little orange book, I would notice it there. And I was like, this guy is everywhere. And then as you work through the next books, you know, Visible Influence, which you can see is like well-worn and the catalyst. And then now your newest book we're going to talk about today, Magic Words. When I saw that I was going to have a chance to speak with you, this is 10 years in the making for me. So first of all, thank you. And second of all, you have to live up to some really high expectations. <laughs> it's going to be difficult, man. Thank you so much for the support. I greatly appreciate it. Nothing makes me happier than seeing a book that is completely dog-eared. The books that I love are often dog-eared. They have lines in them and other sorts of things. And so nothing makes me happier than to see someone else's book look like that. And I will do my best to live up to those expectations. I, I appreciate that. And what I'm so excited to talk to you about is this idea of influence, because I think so much of your work boils down to either understanding that there are powers at play in the world, in media, in social media, I think we all know. But even all of these unknown, subconscious things are happening in our minds. And it seems like you've dedicated your career to understanding why things take off, why things spread, why they become viral. And in doing so, you almost have to like study how we are influenced. So before we dig into like all of the tactics of persuasion and everything else, can you just help me and all of our viewers understand why, as people, we're so easily influenced? Yeah, you know, I think particularly in a sort of North American culture, more generally, influence can almost be seen as a bad word, right? Like, oh, I was influenced. Why, why are you influenced? People hate seeing themselves as influenced. They don't want to be influenced. But what's so interesting is being influenced in general, broadly speaking, is quite useful. So imagine every time you wanted to buy a product, every time you wanted to pick a restaurant, every time you wanted to go on vacation, you had to do all the work yourself to figure it out. Even take something as simple as where to go for lunch. You'd have to look at all the menus yourself. You'd have to get and sample them, right? So how would you know if a place would be any good? And so life would be not only a lot more time consuming, but also just a lot more difficult. And so influence can be very useful. It can be very adaptive, right? Influence can help us make better decisions by relying on others' experiences. Sometimes often in a commercial, a product will look great, but it's not actually that great. And so relying on our friends and peers helps us make better decisions, not just what the company wants us to think, right? But what people actually say, you go to a restaurant's website, it looks amazing. But if you look at the reviews, they'll say, well, it looks amazing, but the food isn't as good as they promised. Well, now that influence really helped me make a better decision, or even if it doesn't help me make a better decision, it can help me make a faster decision, right? It can help make a good decision faster. In many cases, ordering things online, for example, almost all the options are pretty good, right? It's not like many of them are going to be terrible. And so you can't really go wrong, but seeing what others have liked the most will help you find something quickly that's quite good. And so whether it's saving us time, effort, energy, or just making our lives better, influence is often quite useful, right? Think even as our sort of our early prehistoric forebearers, imagine if you couldn't be influenced, you had to figure out where to hunt for food just because you knew that information yourself. Life would be really hard. And so relying on others helps us forage for information more quickly and makes us better off. And so, yes, in today's world, seeing ourselves as influence can be can be perceived negatively, but it often makes us better off. It's, it's funny because when I asked that question, <laughs> I asked it knowing I was like, oh, I can't wait to talk about how terrible influence is on <laughs> us and how it's making us do the things we don't want to do and not even giving us all the options for the decisions we make. And yet you've completely flipped it on me because you reminded me of, I got laser eye surgery a yeah. bunch of years ago. 
And at the time, one of my employees, who is one of the most analytical people in the world, I knew he had laser eye surgery. And so I said, okay, where did you get this LASIK done? And he listed a local clinic. I said, okay. And then I asked someone else, hey, where did you get it done? They said the same clinic. And I didn't look anything else up then. Yeah. I didn't spend any more time on it. I didn't look it up. I went for the consultation. They, they were like concerned with the price. I said, I don't really care what it costs. They were saying, which package? I said, I, just whatever this person said. Do you have any questions? I have no questions. Yeah. Just because I trust these two people. Yes. And I realized I don't need to go down the same rabbit hole they went down. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I, I love a few things about that, right? So first of all, it just made your decision much easier. And sure, you could have looked at brochures, but the brochures probably would have said the same things. We have great service. We care. No company says they don't care about their customers. But so saying you care about your customers isn't very diagnostic. But if two people went and they had a great experience, you're probably going to have a great experience as well. And that, that also speaks to something I talk about in the Catalyst, which is this idea of corroborating evidence. Right. Sometimes if we're trying to make a small decision or change somebody's mind about something that's pretty simple, we're basically trying to move a pebble, right? You don't need a lot of evidence to move a pebble, but to move a boulder, to move a big decision, laser eye surgery, right? if one person said it was good, you probably say, well, that isn't enough. But if multiple people say the same thing, you're pretty sure you're going to have the same experience. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to come out blinded, yeah. which, which was my concern. Yeah. Here, right? I don't want to be blinded in the surgery. And there's an old adage that goes something along the lines of, you know, if one person says you have a tail, you laugh at them. Why? Because you don't have a tail. But if five people say you have a tail in short succession, then you might turn around to take a look. Because if five people were different people say the same thing, it's much harder to believe that they're wrong. And so influence can be really helpful from the mundane decisions of our daily lives to the really important ones. Now, everyone listening and watching is, we're achievers, right? We're leaders. We know that we've been called to do something bigger. And so we're always pumping up against our comfort zones. We have a big vision. We want to make things happen. Uh, and I've learned the hard way that you really can't build big things alone. I've tried many times because it just seems faster and seems like I have more control. So as leaders, we're often having to influence others to like, come along with us and this is going to be great. And here's the promised land. Or we're trying to convince in like a sales opportunity, we're trying to convince someone to buy from us. We're trying to convince someone, a spouse, that for the first time ever, we are going to change. We're not going to just do the same thing yeah. over and over again. And so we spent so much time convincing. And yet, I don't know, if as soon as someone tries to convince me of something, not only do I get my back up against a wall instantly, I get so cold and rude that my yeah. wife knows in my tone... Like I've, I tell people I love, do not ever try to sell me on anything. I love you. And so I want to believe what you believe. So please don't hurt yourself by trying to sell me. Yeah. What is it about convincing people that just doesn't work? Yeah. So it's interesting. What you're talking about is this psychological principle called reactance. And the basic idea is when pushed, people push back. Right. When people try <laughs> to convince them. Yep. Think, <laughs> you should see me and my wife have a conversation. <laughs> Yeah. Often when I talk about the catalyst, I often put up this figure of sort of a person and so forces that we might be pushing on them to push them in a certain direction. And for objects that works really well, right? there's a chair and we want to move that chair. Pushing the chair is a great way to get a slide across the floor. The problem is when we push people, they don't just sit there, they push back. They think about all the reasons they don't want to do what we've suggested. They dig in their heels. They become less likely to do what we wanted, not more. And, and part of it is this idea of reactance, right? People have an ingrained anti-persuasion radar. They want to feel like they are in charge of their lives. Why did I make a certain choice, buy a certain product, do a certain thing? I did it because I thought it was a good idea. But as soon as we, whether we are a salesperson, whether we are a marketer, whether we are a boss, whether we are a colleague, whether we are a spouse, whoever we are, as soon as we come in and try to tell someone to do, now they're no longer clear, okay, am I doing this because I thought it was a good idea, because I like it, or because you told me to do it? And the more I feel like I'm doing it because you told me to do it, the less interested I am in doing it. And so rather than pushing people, we've got to figure out how to remove the barriers to change. I think a good analogy is think about being parked in your car. So Maybe you're coming out of your kid's soccer game, or you're coming out of a movie, your, your car's on a hill. You get in the car, you stick your key in the ignition, you step the foot on the gas. If the car doesn't go, we often think, oh, I just need more gas. Push on the gas, more the car will move. Same with people. If I just push them a little harder, they'll change. But if the parking brake is up in that car, it doesn't matter how much you step on the gas, it's not going to go anywhere. And so the same is true with people, right? We need, rather than stepping on the gas so much, we need to figure out what those parking brakes are what those barriers or obstacles are in, in the way of change and figure out how to mitigate them. 
Are there simple ways that we can help figure that out? Because often we don't have time to plan. It's nice if you have time to plan out a pitch deck or if you have time to perhaps rehearse in your head how the conversation can go, which is something that I do quite often. But how can we render this out in real time when we find ourselves being hit with all of these different objections? And frankly, we just need people to do what we say. <laughs> just do it. I'm trying to help you here. Why are you making me work so hard to help you sometimes? Yeah. So I'm, there are a bunch of tactics in the catalyst. Some of them require a little bit more preparation, but some require very little preparation, right? So I often talk about a strategy I called ask, don't tell. Um, and the idea is something like this. When we tell people something, they push back. When we ask them questions, they do something a, a little bit different. So a few years ago, I was talking to a startup founder. She's having trouble motivating her team. She was saying, you got to work late, you got to work on weekends, and they didn't want to do it. And I often talk to audience where they say, but I'm the boss, right? I can get people to do what I want. And I think what's tough, even when you're the boss, is you can tell people to do what you want them to do. And in some cases on the surface, they'll even do what you want them to do. But if they're not really believing in what you've asked them to do, they're not going to do their best. You tell them, oh, you have to be available at all hours of the day. And so they'll send out an email at 2 a.m. at night, but they're not actually available, right? They've just delay sent an email to make it seem like they're working at 2 a.m. And so when we push people too much, they figure out ways around what we wanted them to do. And so rather than pushing people so much, she called a meeting. And she said, okay, what do we want to be? Do we want to be a good team, a good company, or a great company? And they said, of course, oh, a great company. But then she asked a real question. She says, okay, how do we get there? How do we become a great company? And she starts having a conversation. People say this, and they say that, and eventually they get to solution. Because questions do three things. First, they deactivate that anti-persuasion rate. Rather than telling people what to do when they push back, you've asked them a question. People are more than happy to give you their opinion. There are a few things they like doing more than giving you their opinions. And so you've deactivated that anti-persuasion radar. But second, you've allowed yourself to collect information, right? Too often as change agents, we know a lot about the outcome we want to achieve, a lot less about the people or organizations we're trying to change. Questions allow us to collect that information. They allow us to figure out what are the objections? What are the problems? What are the barriers? What are the roadblocks? And allow us to reach a better solution. But then third, questions encourage commitment to the conclusion. Because if someone says, okay, great boss, to become a great company, I think we should do this. And then the boss says, fantastic, we're going to do that. It's a lot harder for that person not to go along because it was their idea in the first place. I was presenting these ideas about six months ago and somebody goes, oh, it's so funny. My boss loves feeling like things are their idea. And I said, the only funny thing here is it's not just your boss, right? Everyone likes feeling like something is their idea because if you feel like it's your idea, you're bought into it. You want to see it succeed. And so often we need to give away ownership, right? Because the more we can make people feel like something isn't ours, but it's theirs, the more they want to succeed, right? the more they've been a part of the process that reached a conclusion, the more they feel like they participated. And so they're bought into the outcome. And so rather than telling people what to do, asking questions can be a great way to help them get to and us get to a better outcome. I love this so much. I'm obsessed with questions. And part of it is that for some reason early on, and I don't know if I caught on to this because I loved it already, or if this idea made me love it more. But I heard early on that old-timey Jewish rabbis in the day would teach through asking questions. Oh, yes. And then the more I learned about Buddhist and Zen principles, the more I realized that monks would ponder these big life questions. And so I get into arguments with my family about this because I will pose questions to my kids because I know in them trying to solve for the answer, it's a better way for them to learn than to just get to the answer. And so I'll ask them a rhetorical question or I'll ask them a question that I already know the answer to. My wife will just answer it for them. And I'll turn over. I was trying to yeah. get them to yes. answer the question. Yes. But I've also learned just because of the amount of time I've spent in strategy and consulting with people and even helping lead consensus, build consensus. You can use questions in a really powerful way through, I guess, maybe like more rhetorical style principles yep. to close things off. So my father-in-law over Christmas was here and my mother-in-law was really upset with him because she thinks that they always do what he wants to do. <laughs> and she wanted to cook food that he didn't like, like with onions, let's say. And so I just turned to him and like, we're having a bunch of wine at the time, but I turned to him and I said, you love your wife, don't you? Yeah. Her happiness is important to you, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And I said, wouldn't you do anything to make your wife happy? And yeah. he stopped. He said, where are you going with this? Yeah. yeah. 
because he didn't want to answer the question. Yeah. I said, Dude, is this true or not? Yes. Yeah. So couldn't you maybe allow her to cook food once in a while yeah. for herself yes. that she yeah. loves? Wouldn't that make her happy? And isn't that the greatest gift you can give your wife? Yes. And he was silent. He was, yes. he was painted into a corner. <laughs> yeah, I would call this highlighting a gap. I talk about this exact strategy in The Catalyst, and I think it's a great one, right? People like their attitudes and actions to line up. If you say you love your wife, you should let her do small things, even if they bug you, that are valuable to her. If you say you care about a certain sports team, you need to watch their games once in a while. If you say you care about the environment, you need to recycle. People want their attitudes to actually line up, but we can create the things that line up by highlighting that gap. Well, he does love his wife, but he wasn't thinking about that. At the moment, he was focused on, man, I hate onions. Why would you cook this thing I don't like? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so by highlighting through questions, a part of his attention right? You brought that next to something else. You made him more likely to go, I've got to pick between these two things. Do I love my wife or do I hate onions? Loving my wife is more important than hating onions. Hopefully at least, or maybe he decided hating onions is more important than loving my wife, but that's called highlighting a gap, right? It's encouraging people to resolve with themselves. You didn't tell him, Hey, be quiet, be nice to her. This is why he got to that conclusion himself, but you led him down the path. And I think that's, what's really powerful about some of the ideas in the catalyst to me. When I say don't push, identify the barriers. I don't mean just sit there and magically hope something happens. It's use questions, use strategies to lead people down a path without them feeling like that's where they're going. And so that can be a really powerful way to help them make that decision themselves. And this is why, honestly, I'm not trying to fan out, boy out too much, but this is what I really find intriguing and I love about your work is you reference all of these studies. You help me understand the pros and cons or even maybe some applications for them. But I know how much information is out there that I just don't understand or have access to. And I also recognize that these are almost like marketing books for marketers or for advertisers. But we all must influence people. And yeah. we all must recognize when we're influenced. And so even just one random study that you reference, I think an invisible influence about the fact that if you're in a gym, if you're doing anything and there are other people around, regardless if you're competing against them or not, just by the nature of having people around, you are more likely yes. to perform in a more aggressive way. I think about that every time I'm in the gym now. Yeah. I think about that every time I'm working out alone and I go, okay, how can I turn this thing that's in the Social dark? facilitation, yeah. Yeah. And I do tons of secret eating. Like I know that it's a very uh, addictive type of trait to do secret drinking, secret eating, secret things because you'd be ashamed if people saw you. Yeah. So sometimes when I'm like, oh, I really want to eat this whole bag of chips. Yeah. I'm just going to wait for my daughter to leave the kitchen so I can. Instead, I'll be like, hey, Rachel, stay here and talk to me. Yes. <laughs> or put a picture of her in the bag of chips. I'd hide a little picture. Oh, no. So when you look at oh, that, would like, hurt oh, too boy. much. <laughs> So we could use these things everywhere. Now, the question I do have is when you are putting these books together, you can find a study for anything. Yeah. We can find a study that supports, hey, if being around people motivates people to this outcome. But other times, being solo motivates people to being outcome. Yeah. If you're looking at basketball, being down a few points at halftime means that you're more likely to come back and win. And yet, if you're in another sport uh, like tennis, where it's more of this weird game of one-on-one, -on -one, you're less likely to win. So I find them all super curious and super interesting. But knowing that the fact that you're like a professor of this, how do you figure out in your head how to bucket these different sides of everything when there are so many studies that prove everything? Yeah. So people and life, and I don't have to tell you this or your audience this, you guys know it already, are complicated. It's not like there's one rule and people always behave according to that rule. There are multiple rules that happen in different situations that shape our behavior. I think the problem though, is if you start by saying, hey, things are really complicated. In this situation, this happens. In this situation, this happens. In other situations, people just throw their hands up and go, ah, depends. I don't know. I give up. And so I try really hard in my books to walk a fine line between oversimplifying things in a way that means that even if people applied the rules, they wouldn't actually see the benefit of them. And also being like, it's so complicated. So I often think about it a little bit like an onion. Let's talk about a principle, social facilitation. People tend to work harder when others are around them. Okay, that's true. People tend to work harder when others are around them. Let's give some examples of that. Let's talk about it. Then you say that working harder can lead to better or worse outcomes, right? Working harder can lead to good outcomes if it's something you're already good at, but working harder can actually make you anxious if it's something you're not good at and you'll do worse at it, right? For example, you know, other people around makes you really good at tying your own shoes, but often makes you worse at parallel parking. 
right? Tying your own shoes is something you know how to do really well. You could do it in your sleep. Another person around, no fat, no problem. I'll do it, do it well. Parallel park is already a little bit difficult. Someone else around adds a little anxiety, makes it harder. And so I, I try to start with what we describe as a main effect. This is generally true. And then add the nuance because my hope is that people don't walk away going, it depends. I don't know. I give up, but going, I don't just think it depends. I know what it depends on. And if I know what it depends on, I can try to say, is this type of situation or this type of situation? And then I know what to do in each, but life is complicated. Wish it were simpler, but hopefully understanding human behavior will help us improve our batting average in whatever we're doing, whether we're trying to persuade others, whether we're trying to form deeper relationships, whether we're trying to live happier and healthier lives, the more we understand about human behavior, the better off we'll be. And on that, let's talk about Donald Trump. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You write in your new book, Magic Words, you talk about speaking with confidence. Yeah. You talk about powerful speakers, powerful words, people who speak with such conviction that you can't help but at least believe they think they know what they're talking yes. about. <laughs> yeah. Now, the reason I say let's talk about Donald Trump is why is Donald Trump such a great example of this? Yes. What I don't want to do here is get into politics. What I want to start by saying is whether you like Donald Trump or you don't, you can't deny that he is powerfully persuasive, right? There is a large set of people that when he says something, they believe it's true and they are willing to take action. And I think what's interesting about this is when you think of like famous orators, right? People that are great public speakers, I don't think you would list Trump in that list, right? You think about Abraham Lincoln, you think about Winston Churchill, right? These sort of famous figures that are known for their restrained, dignified delivery. I don't think you would say Trump does that. I wouldn't say that. Uh, Yes, yes, regardless. And and when he was announcing his presidential campaign, one of the things he said was, I'm going to build a great wall. And nobody builds walls better than me. I build them very inexpensively. Our country's in serious trouble. We don't have victories anymore. We used to have victories. We no longer have them. When was the last time I saw us beating China in a trade deal? I beat China, China all the time, all the time. Now, you know, when popular media outlets heard what he said, they poked at him a little bit, right? They said, oh, it was overly simplistic. It was empty. Rhetorically, it was a mess. And a year later, he was elected president of the United States. And so I think it's really easy, particularly if your politics don't agree with someone like Donald Trump, to laugh him off as somebody who got lucky. And I think that is a mistake. Whether you like Donald Trump or not, something he is doing is working. And so I think the more important thing is to step back and go, what is it? Whether I like this person or not, what are they doing that's working? And how by understanding what's working, can I use that to get whatever I care about, whether it's the same thing as Trump or whether it's a completely different thing as Trump, whether I can get people to pay attention to that. Because whether you like him or not, he's done a great job of being a salesman. And so a key question is kind of how he does it. I want to try now and workshop with you these two ideas. So when you're writing a book, you have these complex studies, these complex ideas, these really specific ways of measuring a given outcome in a given situation. And you said it's like an onion. Let's hit the top level and then let's get into the nuance. Yeah. What I struggle with is for those of us who know our craft, who know our space, we know what we know and we know how complex it is. And we also recognize that there's a lot of stuff we don't know. Yep. You bring someone like Trump in, he does simplify it. He does speak with power, but he's totally willing to ignore nuance, obviously. And he's totally willing to put blinders on for all of the other versions of reality that are there, but the one narrative he wants. So I struggle as someone who's like dedicated to my craft to be willing to simplify things enough to go, here's the answer. Yeah. Think about this a lot, right? And I often ask myself, you know, is it better for what you said to be 90% right, maybe 10% wrong, or is it better for people to remember nothing about what you said. And I think that is a deeply philosophical and moral question that different people may have different sort of answers to. But I often feel like, look, if I tell people something and they don't remember any of it, it could be amazingly right, but it's not going to matter. I don't want to be wrong and I'm never trying to be wrong. And if you look at the books I write, there are often many footnotes or endnotes saying, yes, this is generally true, but this, or this is usually the case, but check these things out. There are a lot of references in my books to academic research. And my goal is not for people to believe that I am right. My goal is to direct them to the great research that's out there if they want to learn more. But at the same time, you know, if I said, hey, here's all the information out there, people probably wouldn't take home any of that information. And so we need, as, as folks that care about our craft, We need to think about, look, what is my goal? 
right? When I want someone to learn something in the classroom, for example, and I have an hour to teach them stuff, I've got to make some choices. And you could say, we only want to teach them things that's right. That's fair. But you could also say, hold on, what about all the things you didn't teach them, right? You are making choices all the time. And so, yes, you want to teach them things that are right, but you also want to put it across in a way that will be more memorable. And so take something like hedges, for example. So we do this all the time. We say things like maybe and possibly and could and might, and it seems to me. And we do all that as a, almost a subtle kick, right? I do it all the time. I'm terrible at this. I am the governor. I'm the mayor of Hedge City. Let me yes. tell you. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not saying hedges are bad, but hedges reduce persuasion. Oh, you just hedged. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, hedges are bad. That's what we're saying. So let me get there. Hedges reduce persuasion. We've done a bunch of empirical research showing if you hedge when you say something, people are less persuaded by what you said. They're less likely to take your suggestions, take your advice, follow your action, because you seem less certain, because you seem less confident about what you're talking about. And so one thing is to say, okay, never hedge. That's right, right? I'm not saying never hedge. I'm saying if your goal is to communicate uncertainty, that's fine, but recognize that people are going to be less persuaded as a result. Maybe what you want to do is be very certain about a smaller set of things rather than uncertain about a larger set of things, right? Maybe you want to be clear about what you're certain about and clear what you're not certain about. So express a great deal of certainty, but separate the uncertainties and the certainties. And so I agree, you got to understand what your goal is. But I think if we do things by mistake that don't help us, we probably should be aware of those things. Oh, I I visualize in my head these little unlocks when uh, if you've ever played an RPG or something and you're like, yes, I just leveled up my armor and some little (laughs) thing happened. You just gave me an unlock because I do struggle at simplifying, not for others. I can see it's super clear in others, but for myself, just keeping this the scope of conversation or the scope of what we're doing super, super narrow. And within that narrow scope, I definitely know what I'm talking about, but I allow myself to go too broad, to go too big yeah. into all the areas that I, I might have an opinion on, but I'm not really sure about. Yeah. And I don't know why I do that, actually. Maybe I think if I just talk about this one thing or do this one thing, it's too limiting, it's too small. Maybe there's ego there. Maybe it feels like I'm going to get bored or run out of things to do. <laughs> I don't know, but that's an unlock. So thank you. Yeah. And I think it, it does also depend on what our goals are. Right? And it depends on what situations that we're in. And not saying, you know, never hedge. There's this old Albert Einstein quote, and I'm going to get it wrong, but it goes something along the lines of, if you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well. And that doesn't mean you're explaining everything. But I think if you truly understand something, you can figure out a simple way to to talk about it. Even if it's, look, this is right in this situation, and this other thing is right in this other situation. Rather than saying this happens sometimes, being clear about when it happens, not just it depends, but what does it depend on? I think great teachers do a good job of that. That is amazing. Another thing that you speak of, which I want to dig into, is this idea of talking to yourself. Yeah, I've started over the last few years talking to myself a lot more, mainly because I realize I get stuck in analysis. So a few Christmases ago, I'm down here in my basement, renovating my son Jonah, his room, I'm building a room for him in the basement. And I found myself staring at like, wood pieces and a tape measure, and I'm holding a pencil in my hand, and I'm just standing there trying to think. And I literally said, I said, like, Mark, measure the board. Yeah. I'm like, huh, okay. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm measuring the board. And I'm like, it's 43 inches. Okay, it's 43 inches. Go cut the piece of wood. Yeah. I don't know if I was nervous or... I don't know what it is, but I've realized like... And now I do that. Now, especially if I'm working out. <laughs> I'll just be like, yes. the guy's like, go, yep. push, don't stop. But I talk a lot to myself and I've started journaling and writing and, and writing to myself in third person because for some reason, it feels a little more objective. And it feels if my son or my daughter or my friends were coming to me for advice, this is the advice I'd give them. So I just write out the advice yeah. I need to hear as if it's coming yeah. from someone else. Yeah. And I don't know why this stuff works, but it, it seems to keep me from falling apart. <laughs> yeah. I think what you say is so interesting because I think about this a lot as a consultant. I often work with companies and organizations. They hire me to help with various problems. I am very comfortable giving them advice and very comfortable about being confident about the advice that I give them. But often when it comes to my own business, my own work, I am plagued by uncertainty. Is this the right thing to do? I don't know. Should I move forward with this or not? And so I don't think I and you are the only people that feel this way. I think everybody feels this way, right? So often when we you know, talk to others, we are very confident. We are very clear. We are enabled to get very high level. When we're focused on ourselves, we often get stuck in that sort of low level thing. And we think it will help us and it doesn't. And so what the research actually shows is that using language 
that can distance us our, ourselves a little bit from the situation can actually be quite helpful. So there's some very nice work, you know, where they, they ask people basically to give a presentation, give a presentation, you have five minutes to put together this presentation. It's for something really important. And so not surprisingly, people are really anxious when they're doing this. And for some of the people, they say, hey, talk to yourself like you usually would. So thinking about things, we often say either actually or in our own head, you know, why am I so upset? Why do I feel this way? Using kind of these first person pronouns to speak to ourselves. But another group was asked to themselves a little bit more, right? Act as almost another person would in that situation. So saying something like, why do you feel that way? Or why might he or she feel that way? Like you say, Mark, just go do it. An outsider would. And they found that this outsider perspective, so talking to yourself, but using language that distances you, really helps you feel more confident, less anxious, and perform better. And as you said, and I think I've been saying as well, it helps us get a little bit of a broader perspective, right? It helps us give that great advice that we might have that we would give to others, but we don't necessarily see for ourselves. And, And I think the key insight here is that language helps us do this right? Talking to yourself using a word like you, talking to yourself using your own name, talking to yourself like he or she helps you treat it like it's an outsider perspective and give that great outsider advice. It seems to me, help me understand whether this is all new stuff that we're just discovering, because it seems like every time a book like this comes out or I'm able to speak with someone with your experience, it's so mind-blowing to me. And so I can't figure out if this is what has always been and it didn't used to matter. If this is what has always been and it did matter and people just accepted it and got on with it. Or if this is all a new way of thinking, a new step in science and psychology and understanding because it's feel like the last 10 years of research and books and all of this understanding... It's just blowing my mind, to be honest with you. I think one thing I found interesting about writing this book, but one challenge I've also found in writing this book is there are a lot of books out there on language, right? A lot of books that say, these are the seven or articles. I often see articles. These are seven words you should avoid. These are the five things you should say in, in interviews. And while I love the goal of those things, unfortunately, they're not often backed by research. Right? It's someone's personal opinion about language. My experience in this field suggests that this is a word you shouldn't use. And let me tell you, I love people's opinions. And just like anybody else, I love opinions. When it comes to opinions, I tend to prefer my own opinion rather than someone else's. But what I like better than your opinion or my opinion or anybody else's opinion is data. Right? Because whether my opinion is right or wrong, proof is in the pudding. Let's see what the data actually says. And so what you're right about is that opinions about language are not new. People have had opinions about language for a long time. What is new is our ability to parse language new ways. So let me give you an example. I share a study that we recently did two or three years ago in this book, where I talk about the power of concrete language. And I do that from a study we did analyzing a couple thousand interactions with customer service representatives. So you call a customer service representative on the phone or you email back and forth with them. We look at the language that increases customer satisfaction and purchase and why. And it's basically certain language shows people that you're listening. Now, that truth has been there forever. We didn't invent the truth that concrete language makes people feel that you're listening. But what's possible now is, well, wait, now these phone calls are recorded. We can transcribe them pretty quickly and we can run automated text analysis through all these conversations to pull out statistical relationships that may have been there forever, but we couldn't see previously. And so there's been a huge wave of increase in measuring language, capturing language. You and I are having a conversation right now using voice, but it may be transcribed after this conversation. Similarly, people leave their opinions and attitudes on social media all the time. We can scrape that data and gain insight into how customers feel. And so everything from the emails that we use, the conversations that we have, we can parse it for insight and there are better tools to do that. And so is language new? No. Are the findings new? They've always been there but we now can uncover them in some new and powerful ways. And being as close to this as you are, is there anything that you see that's worrying or scaring you? Because as you're describing this, I'm thinking, okay, you're going to do this research. You're going to put it in the hands of marketers like us. They say marketers ruin everything. We do. We're going to use it to manipulate people. We're going to use it to influence people. It's going to be short-lived. People will become aware of it. And then is is there like this cat and mouse game? Is this pendulum swinging? Are there things where you're like, 
oh, Mark, don't even worry about that. AI is going to destroy us all anyway. Like, <laughs> like being as close to it as you are, what yeah. is it? Are, are you afraid of anything? I'll say a few things there. First of all, a hammer can be used to build a house. A hammer can be used to hurt somebody. The tool by itself is neither good nor bad. It's neutral. It's just a tool. It's how you use that tool that is either positive or negative. And I think about the same thing about research. If this work that I put out of this new book is used to help people eat healthier and have better relationships and those type of things, if it's used for marketers to help people get to do things that are good and beneficial, help them be better to the environment, help them waste less, help them find things that make them happier, all of that is wonderful. If on the other hand, people use these tools for something bad, well, I prefer they didn't, but they're tools. And so my goal is to help people understand themselves and others and put these tools in people's hands, hope and trust that they will use these tools the right way. And as a both a tool builder and a tool finder, you can't decide how people use the tools, but I leave that to others to decide how to use them. When I hit the part of your new book where you, you speak about this concrete language and change can't to don't, it instantly took me to last May I was at an event for Ed Milet, who was launching a book, and Marie Forleo was speaking. Oh, yeah. And know that you were on her channel a few years back, and you probably know her well. And she gave this whole speech. I think she may even be writing a book on this, but she just said one day she was so completely overwhelmed. She was so completely done with everything. And she finally just said, I don't do overwhelmed. I don't do overwhelmed. And yeah. in saying that, and in taking the power, I don't yeah. eat sugar. I don't do drama. Yeah. I don't like just by putting that frame, she said it, it completely changes everything. And then she said, and there's science that backs that this is actually the case. And yeah. So I, I hit this part in your book. Where I was like, ah, here's the science, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> Why I, is this such a powerful reframe? I think it allows us to take agency. And so this is in the identity and agency chapter. And so I'm happy to try to chat about this. And then I Thing, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up, but it, it's about giving us agency. And I think it does it in two ways, right? One, it helps reduces the complication. If I don't do this, if I don't take clients that pay me less than this, if I don't work on this type of thing, if I don't work with a consulting clients that don't align with my views, I don't have to each time say, oh, is this a right thing or not? I can say, I don't do that. But also it puts me back in control. I I'm choosing something, right? It's not that I, in my goals, for example, or someone's goals, it's not that you know, I can't eat chocolate cake because I'm on a diet which suggests to oneself, oh, man, I really want to do it, but I can't because this diet is getting in the way. Man, I, I wish this diet wasn't getting in the way. Or going back to the secret eating, right? I can't secret eat because my kids would think less of me. And I can do it when they're not around. Whereas if I say, I don't do this. This is not who I am. I'm in the driver's seat. I'm in control. And so it makes me feel more agency and I'm more likely to stick with my goals. Jonah Berger, thank you so much for your time. Uh, your new book, Magic Words, What to Say to Get What You Want is out March 7th. If you're seeing this after March 7th, 2023, you can go ahead to Amazon and pick it up. If before, you can pre-order. Where would be the best place for people to connect with you? You can find stuff about me, my books, my research just at uh, my website, which is firstnamelastname.com. So jonahberger.com. The book is available wherever books are sold. And you can also find me at J1Burger on either Twitter or LinkedIn. 